Health, psychology, and human nature with Andre Stureson. Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. Are you following me on Instagram and Facebook? Please go to Health, Psychology and Human Nature on Instagram or Facebook or both for that matter to get the latest episodes, inspiration and more. Please take a pause and go there. Also, if you like the episode, please share it with a friend, family member or somebody else who you think might like it. Welcome back, friends, to Health, Psychology and Human Nature with me, André Stureson, a science-focused podcast where we explore, learn and improve our lives together. How do we sense if we have eaten or not and how is that linked to how long an organism lives? In today's interesting episode, David tells us about the mechanistic target of rapamycin. MTOR for short. Professor David Sabatini is a member of the Whitehead Institute at MIT and perhaps more importantly is the person who discovered MTOR. Friends, I really hope you enjoy today's interesting episode. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Really nice to have you on. Um, yeah, well, I think we're gonna talk a lot about MTOR today and I think Perhaps we should just, I'm just curious to know, like, um, aging and amateur and everything, what is it that that fascinates you or that you find interesting about all the stuff that you're you're doing? Sure. So it's a very, very big question, I guess. Uh, I, I think what, what's interesting about mTOR, which, as you know, is a protein and it's a protein kinase, so it, it works inside our, our cells. Uh, and, and we think what it does is basically connect whether we have nutrients to then whether an, an organism is catabolic or anabolic. So that, that's the, the little basic science part. But I think what's interesting about mTOR is that it seems to do so many things right. in the cell and that its inhibition, or at least its partial inhibition, has been shown now in many different organisms, in, including mammals, to prolong lifespan. So that, that's a quite a unique uh, attribute to it. Very, very few proteins seem to be connected to as many processes and then to have this sort of you know, quite, quite interesting outcome when inhibited, which captures people's imaginations. Interesting. Inter okay, so it can, seems to be able to affect lifespan. Um, yeah, maybe we should just start off then by talking about mTOR a little bit more, just what it is. So for, for somebody who's never heard about mTOR, like, yeah, how would you explain what mTOR is? Yeah, so, so again, it's a protein, right? So these are, the, these are the parts of cells that execute things. They do things inside of cells. But most functions a cell has are done by proteins. And the way that I like to describe mTOR is a little bit to analyze, analogize it to thinking about a construction site, right? So if you have a construction site, you need to bring in many, many different types of workers with different expertise, right? You need plumbers, you need carpenters, bricklayers, people that dig holes, electricians. You, you, could, you could probably have dozens of different types. And someone has to control all that. And at least in the United States, we call that the general contractor. I'm not sure what you might call it in, in Sweden. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The group that does all the timing, right, decides, oh, we need bricks order bricks, right? And it does in the appropriate time. If it rains, they decide to change certain things about the construction site. Um, if there's accidents, they change things, they repair things. So mTOR, I see it as the general contractor of the cell. It controls almost all the large processes that our cells do from making proteins to making RNA, to making lipids, to making the components of, of DNA. It controls all of them. And it does so in response to many, many different kinds of signals, right? Just like a general contractor might have to care about the city inspector and about the weather and about what happened to the paint that they ordered and what happened to when there was a fire on the site. mTOR listens to lots and lots of different signals. But if you had to categorize them and say, what's the dominant signal that mTOR listens to? It's nutrients. And by nutrients, of course, I mean the building blocks that make up our body, right? Amino acids, glucose, and lipids. 
But not only those, but then also the signals that our body uses to know we have nutrients. The, the best and the most famous of these is, of course, insulin, right? Your body secretes insulin when you ingest glucose. So mTOR also listens to these secondary signals. So in a, in a nutshell, mTOR is this general contractor, regulates really almost any large process inside of the cell, particularly those that use energy and use nutrients. And it does so into whether, in response to whether we have nutrients or not. Interesting. And it does have to do a lot with growth as well, right? Right. And so, so mTOR, in a, again, in a big picture way, you can think of it as all these things that it regulates, it can put them in two states, the on state or the off state. And when things are in the off state, the cell is what you would call catabolic. That is, it's breaking down its components to release nutrients. When it's in the on state, it's anabolic. It's using nutrients to build mass. And, and you can imagine how when you have nutrients, you want to build mass, you want to build up the cell. When you don't have nutrients, you need to get nutrients from somewhere. If they're not coming from the outside. You need to get them from your own tissues. So you need to break them down and therefore have energy and nutrients to do the essential processes of a cell. So when, when mTOR is on, when there's high nutrients, it promotes growth. And by growth, we mean the accumulation of biomass, everything that makes a live tissue, proteins, RNA, lipids, sugars, all those things, you can call them biomass. mTOR promotes the accumulation of biomass and therefore the growth of an organism, the increase in mass and the increase in size. Right, interesting. So you're talking about these two different processes, anabolism, catabolism. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about, about that. So anabolism, for example, like why is that important for an organism, like in a nutshell? Okay, so anabolism, again, is, is the accumulation of mass and an increase in size. Now, clearly during development, right, when an organism is growing in size, you, you can imagine why anabolism is, is critical, right? A, a child can't grow without anabolism. And in fact, in animal models, if you inhibit mTOR genetically, pharmacologically, you get smaller animals. Right. Eventually, when they stop growing, that, that final size is smaller. Now, it's a more challenging question to ask why does that matter in a grown organism like us mm. right we're not changing in size but the truth is that our tissues are constantly breaking down and being remade right we're breaking down components and we're remaking them in a constant cycle so you always then have to decide whether you're in the making part or the breaking down part you can ask why does that happen, and that's probably important for keeping tissues relatively functional. And, and indeed, when we when we prevent the breaking down part, the catabolism part, which the the best way we do that in connection to the mTOR pathway is by blocking a process called autophagy. Mm. Um, this is this first to self eating. Um, that's the main way that mTOR, when it's inhibited, promotes catabolism is through autophagy. If we block that process, tissues don't like it. They, they get sick. The, the, the tissues, for example, in the muscle and the brain don't do well because you need to have this recycling and remaking. All right, interesting. Um, and from my understanding, um, the, the fasted state or catabolism or when, when you inhibit mTOR, for example, then that is something that is also important for longevity and that is also re rejuvenating. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the the rejuvenating part, I think I would say that that is still a little bit of an open question. Can okay. you take an old animal and make it younger? I, I think the evidence is trending that way. But can you take an animal at a relatively youthful age, start inhibiting mTOR and make it live longer? I think the answer there is clearly yes. And as I pointed out, it's been done by multiple researchers in multiple systems. And and the most common question I get is why? <laughs> yeah. why, why does that why does mTOR do this? And, and why, why is that relatively unique, right? That's the other counterpart. There are not that many pathways. So mTOR is at the center of a pathway we call the mTOR pathway, which has dozens of components beyond mTOR. Why is the mTOR pathway relatively unique from that point of view? Um, and I think those two questions are connected. And I think they go back to that analogy that I made of the general contractor, right? Mm -hmm. So now imagine that you already have a building, right? And you need to keep it in good repair. 
right? And again, that's going to require lots of different expertises, right? Electricians, painters, carpenters, people that, that make you new floors, all the things that are required to keep a building in a relatively good state. And how do you control all those things? It wouldn't be enough, you know, if you had an old building and you came and changed the wiring, you hired an electrician, it's not going to make it a, you know, a younger feeling building. It's still going to be an old building. And so again, mTOR is one of the few ways that you can regulate many, many processes at one point. And I think that's what makes it relatively unique. And because when you inhibit mTOR, you do this catabolism, you break down the existing components. And then when you relieve that catabolism, you then build them back up. You can, at least simple-mindedly, that seems like something that would help keep something young, right? Mm. Throw out the old, make new. It, at least simplistically, it seems that that would make sense. Um, and what's interesting is if you ask of the many, many things that mTOR does, what might be the most important for its sort of pro longevity uh, impact, it might be this autophagy process that I mentioned. If you can't break things down through autophagy, inhibition of mTOR has far less effects on lifespan. This has been done, for example, in worms. Right. Interesting. So it's so it's kind of so it's kind of if if you if if you don't have that much resources during a period of time, and so then it's kind of like taking out the old stuff from your from your house, or perhaps taking off things that's not working that 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 well, and then once you get money again, it's kind of you know, getting new stuff, which works better and there, thereby getting a better working home, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And, and in this case, you're actually building it, of course, rather than, than buying it from the outside. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and it's an interesting, almost philosophical question is why do things like fasting or caloric restriction, which in many ways, mTOR inhibition mimics caloric restriction, right? Why, why do those prolong lifespan? Why did we evolve for that? And, and, and I think the answer there is likely that periods of fasting and even prolonged periods of fasting were probably very common in our evolutionary history and, and is very common in the history of all animals, right? Most animals in the wild are more in a fasting state than not. And, and probably during those states, in a way, you're pausing things, right? You're, you're allowing that animal to be in kind of a pause state until there's resources to eventually procreate because that's what the animal needs to do eventually is to reproduce and you, and you can't reproduce if you're in a fasted state right, right. you don't have enough energy and and uh, nutrients to build a new organism much less to support it when it's born so i would think that's the reason that nature has almost acquired this capacity to sort of prolong lifespan when there's periods of fasting but that, that's a sort of an idea really So is it that you do you believe that it's it's due to the removal of things that are not working in the body that is seems to be the the most important thing and then getting them back when it comes to to lifespan and health span? Yeah, I think that's an open question, but yeah. but but it um there are things that are not working and and whether those things are detrimental simply because they're not working or whether they're overtly toxic. Right. So, so for example, protein aggregates, which have been connected to many diseases, I think there's evidence that at least certain forms of those aggregates, maybe smaller ones than we can see, but, but some form of aggregates is probably overtly toxic. Mm. And so maybe periodically destroying those, as you might do through an autophagic process, uh, is good. Um, at the same time, if things aren't working, clearly replacing them with, with cellular parts that work is also likely good. Right. Right. But yeah, from, from my understanding, it, from your point of view, it's really that, yeah, as you mentioned also, that mTOR is really doing a lot of stuff that is really that it's really affecting a lot of different processes. And that is what makes it special. And that is what seems to be key here when it comes to its effect on lifespan and health span. Right. It's one, it's a node that if you perturb that one node, you can cause many different things. There's very few other pathways in the cell that you could tweak and do so many things. And so, you know, you could take a cocktail of other molecules yeah. that perturb many, many ways and probably get the same effect. But if you had to pick one, mTOR modulators are a good choice. Yeah. So from, from your experience, so would you say that mTOR is like, is it kind of the most important pathway when it comes to its effect or affecting aging and, and health span? 
you know, I, I think it, getting into these competitions, it's, it's a fun thing to do with, with science colleagues and to say mTOR is the most important. And, you know, I, I, I've joked on Twitter, mTOR is the most important protein <laughs> in the body. Uh, right. I don't know. I think it's, it's clearly one of the central pathways now. You know, I, I don't know. There may be others. It may be there's others, but they're hard to modulate. But it's one of the more important ones. I think it's safe to say that. Okay. Interesting. Um, I was also really in, interested to know, you know, like, wh- why is it not good to, you know, always be eating and always be growing and, you know, storing energy when it comes to having a longer life? Yeah, I, I, I again, I, I think, I think what I, I view that the best way of modulating something like mTOR is that you have periods of anabolism followed by periods of catabolism, so a cycling. Mm. So you can imagine if if you're overeating, um, which we know we know has many detrimental effects from the obesity itself to what it does to your heart, to atherosclerosis, right? There's lots to the, to the skeletal system. But you can imagine, again, simplistically, that if you're always driving the anabolism side of mTOR, if mTOR is always seeing nutrients, always, mm. you would never really get much of this catabolic cycle. Um, and, and some people argue, and I think this is relatively true that with the modern human diet, we're never really quite fasting, right? Maybe overnight is the closest we get to fasting, but we don't really ever fast. Um, and so, you know, some people, and including me once in a while, what, what I try to do is to sort of, you know, have dinner and then skip breakfast. And that gives you now a longer fast, right? right. From some time in the evening to, to noon or something. And so uh, that that you know, some people would argue that that's enough time to maybe induce processes like autophagy, although that's really never been proven in a in a human. Right. Um, when it com- when it comes to mTOR, and if let's say if you would like to uh, to to inhibit mTOR and and like focus on lifespan, healthspan, like what are the different things that you can do in terms of lifestyle to have to inhibit mTOR yes this is a complicated question so so mTOR as I mentioned to you senses many many different kinds of nutrients Um, but if you had to sort of pick the most important ones again this is this is a little bit arbitrary but but I think fair amount of data backs this up you would probably say amino acids Mm. which are the components of protein so amino acid a steak has a lots of amino acids and then probably insulin. So therefore, glucose, carbohydrates to insulin. So if I, if I had to pick two and said, you can only pick two things that regulate mTOR, I would pick amino acids, I would pick insulin. And so um, a simple answer to your question, which is simple to say but not necessarily easy to execute, is, well, keep keep those low. Mm. You know, they turn on mTOR, so keep them low, keep your mTOR inhibited. And one way you can do that is during fasting, right? You, you basically... Don't eat anything. Those things are low. Um, your your muscle starts to break down a little bit when you fast to release amino acids. But but mTOR works in an interesting way where you need all of those signals to be there for mTOR to be active. We call it a coincidence detector, right? Amino acids are not sufficient. Insulin is not sufficient. You need both of those plus the many others that mTOR senses. And so I think one way is fasting, right? When you fast, your insulin is low. Even, even if you start breaking down your muscle and amino acids start to come back up, your insulin is still low. So that's one way. Mm-hmm. Another way would be through the modulation of the diet. So you'd want to lower amino acids. But then what do you substitute with? That's the problem, right? So there's lots of evidence that low-carbohydrate diets help you keep weight off or at least help some people keep weight off. Um, but those, of course, that are carbohydrates, which will turn mTOR on, so I think the best answer is to probably eat diets that are relatively low in amino acids, right? So not excessive meats. And then the carbohydrates are not the simple carbohydrates like sucrose. They're complex carbohydrates, which take a long time to digest. And therefore, the amount of simpler carbohydrates that are getting into your blood are lower. And therefore, your insulin isn't going so high. And therefore, your mTOR isn't going so high. And so what are those? Well, those tend to be the things you always hear about grains, certain vegetables, mm. right? Things things take a while to digest. And so the diet that I tried to do, I try is a fairly low carbohydrate diet, certainly simple carbohydrates with meat once in a while. 
Um, I, I don't pay as much attention to, to things like fats um, that, uh, that, you know, in terms of from, from an mTOR point of view, fats tend to be the least important signal. But they do, of course, have interest, important impacts on, on your cardiovascular state and atherosclerosis. Um, but I tend to pay less attention to them. Right. Okay. So, so you mentioned a, a couple of different things there. One of the things was, uh, yeah, was fasting. And you mentioned before that it's not really been shown that an intermittent fast or a time restricted eating, like a sixteen eight, uh, would induce autophagy. But still, like, like, what are your thoughts on uh, time restricted eating, like sixteen eight, for example, and its effects on mTOR and longevity? Yeah, so, so I, again, I think I, I know there's a whole field of the exact amount of time, an exact part of the day, right, from a, from a sort of circadian clock point of view yeah. that one does fast. And I have not thought very much about that. So I'm not really very capable of, of talking about it. So right. I mean more a period of time where clearly your insulin is low and your mTOR becomes inhibited. Um, and, and I think anecdotally, right, people do seem to lose weight, right? When they do these sort of, as you called it, sort of 16, eight, uh, type, uh, type diets, but showing in a person that your mTOR is inhibited and their autophagy is on is, is hard to do, right? Yeah. To measure autophagy, you, you need to take a muscle biopsy. Right. Um, I, I think it's very interesting to think about how you can do these things non-invasively. It's something that, that I'd like to spend more time, uh, working on. Uh, but now we have to base it on extrapolating from animals and mice where we can do these experiments. Um, and also just anecdotally, some of these things seem to work. Right. So, so, so do I understand you correctly that it's more of a longer fast where you don't eat for longer periods of time that seems to be better when it comes to inhibiting mTOR? Or... Well, I'm not sure it's better, Andre, but, but you know, all of these interventions, the, the most important thing is that you do it, yeah. right? And part of doing it, again, if you want it, if you want to, right? But it's, these things are hard to do. So caloric restriction is incredibly hard to do, right? Each of your meals, shrink it to 70% of what you would have eaten. No one has time to calculate these things, they're too hard. And so I think what, what, what has happened is that people are gravitating to what's simple. Skip breakfast is simple. Low carb diet is simple. Don't eat pasta, don't eat rice, don't eat bread. Don't eat potatoes. Pretty easy thing to, to, to do. So, so I don't know if any of these things are better or not better. And, and again, I think that's a really interesting question that at some point one would like to study in humans in very large studies, but how you get the money to do that is, is another question. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would say anything is the best, but some of these things seem to work. And perhaps more importantly, they're relatively easy to do, right? The the sixteen eight okay so you skip breakfast once you get used to that that's not so bad, and then you kind of eat normally the rest of the day, you know removing certain foods from your diet like for me I try to again do somewhat of a low carb diet I, I never was a big rice person or a big potato person you know pasta I like bread I like so those some of those things you know I I, I eat once in a while, um, but but they're again they're much less hard to do than other kinds of of interventions right. I was also thinking about, you, you mentioned amino acids before. Um, when it comes to amino acids, if you is, is there a difference if you do, let's say you do resistance training three times a week, is there a different effect from, from how much amino acids, how, many, how much protein you eat then? Or? Are you saying that, that sort of doing amino acid loading with, with resistance training, whether that's a bad thing for longevity? Is that what you're no, asking? No, no, like or, if, or... If, it, if, it, if it's better, let's say if, if, if it's not that, like if, if a protein is something that activates mTOR, for example, and if, if you would consume proteins and do resistance training, if that is better than if you would, I mean, eat the same amount of protein and not do resistance training. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard for me to answer that, right? Yeah. I, I think there's there's decent evidence, right, that, that using protein after resistance training does help with maintained muscle mass. Um, my understanding from some of my friends who, who are in that world a little bit more, you know, what, what a lot of muscle builders want to do is avoid catabolic states because they know that autophagy degrades muscle during that time. 
so so I, I don't I don't have a good answer for, for you. I think there's a, there's a very interesting topic as to how exercise modulates mTOR. Yeah. I think there's a whole other level of regulation in the muscle from stretch, for example, electrical firing. Um, that's something I'd like to study as well. Um, but but I don't I don't I don't know what, what the answer to that. My impression would be that yes, it's probably better. Um, and, and exercise obviously has some good properties on its own. Right. All right. I know that another molecule that you've been been focusing a lot is um, rapamycin. So perhaps we can just talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, well, rapamycin is a small molecule and it's a drug now. So by small molecule, of course, we need sort of not a large protein, but really a chemical. Uh, in this case, it's a natural molecule. It's, it's made by bacteria. Uh, and these bacteria were first uh, discovered and, 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 and uh, captured in East Island. Right? East Island is this island that's a territory of Chile that's in the South Pacific. Some people say it's the farthest inhabited landmass from other inhabited landmasses. There's an argument about that. It's one of those, though. And, and its indigenous name is Rapa Nui. And so it was rapamycin was named rapamycin in deference to Rapa Nui. And in fact, that's how we and others discovered mTOR was using rapamycin because rapamycin had these interesting properties. It, uh, you know, it affected this, this, the cycling of cells or proliferation. It had immunosuppressive effects, it had antifungal effects, anti-cancer effects. This was before the, the aging side was, was appreciated at all. It had anti-growth effects and that is it inhibited protein synthesis. And so several people became interested in understanding how rapamycin works. And, and that led to the discovery of the yeast TOR genes and also of the, the mTOR, which is in, in mammals. We used to call it a mammalian TOR. And now the, 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 the naming bodies for, for proteins changed it to mechanistic uh, TOR. Um, so rapamycin plays a critical, critical role uh, in this story. And we now know molecularly rapamycin is a suppressor of mTOR. It doesn't completely inhibit it. And, and in fact, because mTOR is an essential protein, and what I mean by that is if you completely inhibit mTOR, you can't survive. And so rapamycin is a bit of a sweet spot there, where it inhibits enough to have interesting effects, but not too much to be completely toxic. Right. And from my understanding also, there's a lot of stuff that rapamycin doesn't inhibit when it comes to mTOR as well. Right, and and there you need to tell me whether you want me to get into a little bit more than molecular <laughs> biology or, or, or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe maybe that, that question requires a little bit more sort of biology and biochemistry. Yeah, for sure. I was also thinking perhaps um, then maybe because from my understanding, one of the big problems when it comes to rapamycin is that rapamycin, if you take it for a long period of time, it it also has some some negative side effects um, and. And so, so, from my understanding, it's like you're that you're trying to find something that there's, there's this two mTORC one and mTORC two, and that you're trying to find uh, some drug or something that only focuses on, on yeah, one of the two parts. Um, so I was, exactly. It would be interesting to know, like, how's it going with all of all of that? Right. So, so the the complexity here is that I keep saying mTOR, but mTOR is just one protein, and mTOR doesn't work alone. It yeah. actually works as part of complexes. And by complexes, I mean these are these are sets of proteins that are stuck to each other, right, and, and make what we call a protein complex. And the protein complex that matters here is one called mTOR complex 1 or mTOR 1. And so these beneficial effects, for example, on lifespan seem to be mostly mediated from mTOR 1 and not another complex called mTOR 2, okay? The problem is that when you give rapamycin for a long enough period of time, it starts to inhibit mTOR2 as well. And, and we and others have argued and I think shown that some of the bad effects of rapamycin, some of the things that you don't want to happen, for example, like an increase in your glucose levels and increase in your triglyceride levels, may be caused by inhibition of mTOR2 rather than mTOR1. The problem with rapamycin is that it binds to mTOR, which is in both of those complexes. And so it's not shocking that eventually you would inhibit both of them. And so the challenge is how do we inhibit mTOR1 by itself and not mTOR2? 
And there, again, we and others have taken many different approaches. Um, you can try to look for molecules that are specifically binding to the parts of mTORC1 that are not shared with mTORC2. For example, there's a protein called Raptor in mTORC1 that, that we identified a long time ago that's unique. Maybe you could target it. That, that doesn't seem so easy to do. So what our approach has been, and, and again, this is still ongoing, is to go for the mechanisms by which mTORC1 senses nutrients. Remember I said you know, it's a detector of nutrients, and the nutrients that we focused on are amino acids. Turns out that mTOR senses a variety of different amino acids. And so our hope is that by understanding those mechanisms, we can then find mechanisms that are specific to mTORC1 and then develop small molecules to those. And so that's our, that's our grand vision. And, and we'll see whether that, uh, that pans out at the end. Right. So how, how's it going with that then? Well, there's a, there, we've identified a number of, of the sensors. These are the proteins that directly bind the nutrients. For example, one, one of the key nutrients is leucine. It's yeah. one of the more common amino acids. As, as you probably know, bodybuilders take to ten, tend to take leucine shakes or mixtures of, that have a lot of leucine in them. And so our hope is that this sensor, by maybe exploiting the pocket it has that binds, binds leucine, we can perturb it to mimic the absence of leucine. But that, that's still ongoing. Right. Yeah. And, and, and from my understanding, also, it, what you're also trying to do, like in the field, is also trying to perhaps take or make drugs that that can help certain organs, for example, like one focusing on the heart, perhaps, or one focusing on aging or being more specific also. Right. So, so you know, that in a way is a bit of a holy grail because... One of the challenges with a protein like mTOR or, or mTORC1 complex is that it's in all our cells. Yeah. And it probably does different things, different cells. And so how do you get inhibition in one tissue and not in another tissue, right? So one example would be that in the muscle, you know, it's clear you need mTORC1 activity to build muscle. So do you really want to inhibit there? Maybe the muscle is a tissue you want to spare. So one approach would be to get drugs that get into some tissues but not into others, right? That they're selective from, for, for a particular organ. Um, that's also very hard to do, um, but, but again, there's, there's going to be attempts to do those kind of things, but, but they're still very incipient. Right. So about your research, like what is it that you find most fascinating right now? Well, for us, what's been very fun is that, that over the last, I would say, you know, 15 years or so, uh, we've identified many of the pieces of this pathway. Um, mTOR was a long time ago, but then all the mTOR1 components, all the mechanism by which it senses nutrients, the nutrient sensors. And so now we have a big collection of proteins, let's say 20 or more proteins. I think what the challenge is now is to understand why there's so many, why is it complicated? And the answer to that really is that a lot of our work has been in cells that we grow in vitro in a tissue culture dish, is to look in vivo, right? All of these components in different tissues are doing different things under different situations. And to understand how this complexity basically enables physiology and enables physiology to be robust, right? Organisms are amazingly robust. You put them in different environments, you put them under different stresses, and, and they make it to a large extent, right? They adapt and they make it. So all this complexity that when we see it in a cell and culture seems superfluous. Why, why would you make it so complicated? Why would you have five different amino acid sensors? Why just not have one? It's probably because in an organism, this enables a fine kind of regulation that then engenders the robustness of the system. Also, it would also be interesting to know... Um if there's like a, a risk also with M, with inhibiting mTOR, from my understanding also there's a, it's, it's not that good to have an overactivation or to, as you mentioned before, totally inhibit mTOR also. Yeah, look, I, I think, it, it, again, I, I think the everything that, that we have done and others have done, and in fact, we've written reviews about this, there's a sweet spot for mTOR. It, it's a U-shaped curve, too little, is bad. Too much is bad. It's really in the middle that you want to be. And you probably want to cycle between one end of the middle and the other end of the middle. If you completely inhibit mTOR, you can do this. You can take a very potent mTOR inhibitor, give it to a mouse, 
You give it a lot of it, it's dead. It'll die. Okay. If you activate mTOR genetically, every tissue will get sick and eventually destroy itself. It's very clear. So it's the middle that you want to be. And so anything pharmacologically that would push you to one extent extreme or the other is, is not good. Uh, to, uh, to that, that would be a risk for sure. And if, if we would look into the, if, look into the future, um, if you would just have to guess, like what, what do you know, what discoveries do you think that you will made about mTOR in let's say 10 or 15 years from now? <laughs> That's a long time from now, 10 to 15. Let, let's, let's say five years from now. <laughs> sure. Because any scientist who thinks they can know what's going on in 10 years, I think is, uh, is simply not true. Um, you know, I think what we hope to do is again, we, we hope to really figure out these nutrient sensors. I've always been fascinated since, since I went to medical school about how our body connects with the environment, which are the proteins that are making that connection, right? Just like the, the rhodopsin in your eye is detecting the photons and the light. And there's the connection between environment and body. For me, I want to know the connections between the nutrients and your body. And so these sensor proteins, the ones that have the little pockets that bind the nutrients directly, I'm most interested in those. And so I hope we find most of those. Um, we've been hot on their trail for a while. Um, I hope we can understand what they do, right? Why, why so many exist and why different tissues have different ones. And then I hope we can manipulate them like we were talking about before. I hope we can develop small molecules that trick them into doing one thing uh, or another. Those are my uh, main goals, at least in the mTOR side of, uh, of the lab. I, I would say they're, they're fairly basic. I'm, I'm really quite a basic biologist. But what I mean by that is that I study fundamental biological mechanisms rather than more translational on the medical side of things. Um, so that, those are my, 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 my hopes, at least for the next few years. Interesting. So, so what is it that you find so interesting about how, how our body sends things from the environment? I don't know. I, I mean, you know, some of it's just guttural, right? I, I, I remember from medical school when I saw some of the first presentations on, you know, how your gut detects certain foods you've eaten. I, it always, it just captured my, my imagination. I, I guess I see them as amongst the most important proteins that we have because our survival and, and the survival really of all animals has depended on knowing whether you have the right nutrients or not, right? It's not simply have you eaten or have you not eaten. Is did you eat the right things in the right quantities? And and I, it's it's hard to argue that that isn't one of the most important things that we do. And this is completely lost to modern humans that live in you know well-off societies because we have an overabundance of food, right? But if you think of most animals, and unfortunately, you know, a fairly large fraction of the human population, obtaining food, obtaining good food is a, is a task, is, a, is something that's, that's hard to, to do. And our body has evolved to help us make those decisions, to, to, to look at, I, measure the quality of the foods that we've eaten and the quantities and, and make adjustments in our physiology and probably our, our capacity to seek for them. So I see it as a very fundamental problem, but it also just grabs me at a very basic level. I, yeah. I like the idea of these proteins touching things from the environment. <laughs> yeah, okay, I get it. All right, interesting. Yeah, okay, so, so there's something there about, uh, also about, yeah, as you mentioned that, the yeah, also it's also very, very, very important about how, about being, about being able to detect like the right kind of things and, and also, the importance for, yeah, for us as organisms, as humans as well. Right. If you think about it, we, we as humans, you know, we have to make, we have to get many things from the environment because we can't make them, right? A lot of the amino acids are essential. We can't make them. The vitamins we can't get, we have to make certain lipids we have to get. And so we need to figure out ways of knowing we have those. Your body needs to know. Right? Uh, so it's an interesting problem to how that actually happens. Yeah, and it's it's quite interesting how these things, like on a like on a meta level, or it, it seems like quite easy from from far away. But then for somebody as yourself, who's really into nitty gritty of stuff, how complicated kind of everything is. Oh, it's amazing complicated, and I, and I guess <laughs> yeah. again, I think that's the way we want it to be because it makes our physiology robust. Yeah.
it allows us to withstand lots and lots of, you know, imagine the running of a marathon, right? Yeah. What it must do to your body, right? And, and you can do it, right? These extreme fasts, you know, going to high elevation. It's amazing what your body can tolerate. For sure. While still keeping its internal environment relatively stable. Yeah. It's interesting how how everything just can work. All of these different processes and the interaction with everything around us. And yeah, it's it's quite insane when you like stop and think about your your like that your body's actually actually working and everything's working as it's as it should. Yeah, no, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean amazing, exciting fascinating right so yeah interesting okay so um if people would like to you know learn more about your stuff and where where you where your research and everything is there some place to to find you and the things you do well i mean i have my lab has a website um a, a number of years ago maybe two three years ago i wrote um i wrote a piece that's a little bit of a historical piece on on how I got into Ersted and mTOR and some of the contributions we've made and, and that that we, we called that, I called that, actually a, a student helped me came up with this title, but we called it, I think, 25 years of mTOR, mm. uncovering the link growth. And, and a lot of people have liked that as, as a resource because it's, 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 it's written in correct scientific language, but it's also kind of big picture. Right. Yeah. Great. So what? Um, but I'm pretty easy to find online yeah all right so so what would you say like what, what would be the kind of the take-home has message from uh, from this conversation the take-home message well i i think uh, to me the 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 most interesting aspect that's really emerging and it's not only from the work on mtor i would say it's from the work on from many many different uh, angles is that we're entering a new phase of understanding how nutrients impact our physiology. And, and, and I think a very sophisticated way of understanding each nutrient, what it does to different cells, to different proteins. And the challenge now is going to be when you take now the hundreds of different nutrients that we consume in different amounts, how all of that is integrated into you know, controlling our physiological state. And so I, I think we're entering what, what I would call sort of a, a molecular nutrition state uh, where, where increasingly we're going to really understand why, you know, there's so much anecdotal evidence. You take this nutrient and it does this and that. Um, really it's hard to understand this at, at a much deeper level. I think mTOR is part of that story. I think it's an important part of it, but it's not the only one. And so I, I see that as an interesting direction that the field is, is going in. All right, perfect. Dave, it's been uh, it's been really really interesting talking to you. So uh, thank you, big big thank you for for coming on and sharing everything you know. Sure, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Hope you enjoyed the episode, friends. I really need your help. I'm trying to get the podcast out there, so I was wondering if you could help me by leaving a positive rating and a review on your Apple device or the podcast player that you're using, as well as subscribing to the podcast. That really helps getting the show more visible on iTunes and other players. And if you don't know how it's done, then YouTube has a lot of great videos, so you can search there. All right, that's it. Take care. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Yeah.